What is happening guys, Kadi Plays here, bringing you another Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel video. And in today's video, I'm going to be going over three deck profiles for the different decks that I played on Season 21 Ladder in Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel. Um, up until the point where I reached Master 1, of course. So, as you can probably tell, uh, this is not Master Duel, this is Dueling Book. Uh, and the reason I'm recording on here is because... For those of you who have been you know, around my channel for a while, you know this about me already, but I prefer the format of Dueling Book just a little bit better. I think it's easier to you know, do a deck profile, show decks off, show tech cards that off, quickly search, search for stuff, so on and so forth. So I'm using Dueling Book, but I assure you this is Master Duel format, uh, and all these deck profiles are you know, Master Duel legal, of course. So uh, I played two different decks primarily throughout this season of Ladder, uh, Purely and Naturia Runic. There's two versions of Purely that I'm going to show you today, and then one version of Naturia Runic that I kind of modified through the season as Purely, you know, got released into the game, and the meta shifted. So, the first one I want to talk about is actually the regular Purely, purely variant without the Dark World cards. So, really quickly, I'm going to go ahead and go over the 40, you know, or the 40 and the 15, and then we'll talk about the tech choices. Then we'll move on to the Dark World variant, and then we'll talk about Naturia Runic last, but certainly not least. So, starting off with the Purely cards, of course, this is pretty standard across all Purely lists. We have three Purely, three Lilies, three My Friend, three Delicious, three Sleepy, three Pretty, and three Happy. And then, what seems to be pretty standard across the board for all Purely lists is people are playing one Leap and one Street. Um, however, in this variant, that is not using the Dark World cards, I've decided to like you know bump up the count on the streets and the leaps. So we're playing two leaps and three streets. The reason being is because you have less ways of generating card advantage in this deck because you don't have those Dark World cards that just get you free discard fodder. So what you want to do is you want all of your cards to be like maximum value, and seeing more purely cards is going to make it so your, your your lily gets you more cards into your hand that you can then discard so on and so forth it's really that you just want more purely names and between leap and street because we have delicious at three in this format compared to something like the tcg leap is a little less you know important it's not it's still very important obviously i'm not saying it's not important but it's a little bit less important to see in your opening hand or to be able to search out because we have delicious at three and we're able to make noir so efficiently that I decided to go three street and two leap as opposed to three leap and two street. Uh, street is also absolutely fantastic going second. You know, you just slap this down on the board and all of a sudden all your special impurities are untargetable, right? They can't be targeted by card effects, so it makes it really hard for your opponent to deal with your plays and you already break board so easily in this deck. So that is also, you know, part of the reason why I decided to play three street in this list. Uh, we then decided to play the one prod prosperity because, well, it is at one. It should probably be banned, but it's at one. Two triple tactics talent. Uh, this is this is kind of like not a flex spot because I think talents is probably the thing that you should be playing here. But the other alternatives are probably like pot of desires. If you want to play two copies of pot of desires in this list alongside the one pot of prosperity, it is not bad at all. The reason I'm not doing it is just because I don't like banishing my names my all my different quick play spells this card does say draw two but you also do give up a lot of cards in your deck and you know if you hit one or two of your you know white cats then all of a sudden you're putting yourself in a really weird situation uh that's not to say desires is bad it's not at all but i think it's a little less strong in this deck than it is in something like sword soul for example Talents, on the other hand, is phenomenal because a lot of times you're going to be able to draw two anyways, and it's good going first, and it's good going first, it's good going second to try to break your opponent's board. If you go first, you can always look at your opponent's hand, and if they have an out to your noir, you can just rip it, or you can draw two, whatever it might be. When you're breaking a board, you can take control of your opponent's monster, that's going to be a problem, um, and you know, just go from there. Obviously, this card is absolutely fantastic, and you all know how good it is at this point. Uh, then we, of course, for not more non-engine stuff, we have three Maxi, three Ash Blossom, two Effect Veiler. The reason for Veiler over something like Imperm is pretty straightforward and simple. It's solely because you can draw this <clears throat> off of Sleepy Memory during your opponent's standby phase and use it the turn you get it, as opposed to Imperm, where you can't do that. You kind of need to use it when you have no field, or when you draw it on your turn and then set it, and then use it on your opponent's turn, right? That's not to say Imperm is bad. Imperm is still very good, and it, there's arguments to play Imperm over over Veiler, but all in all, I kind of just like 
drew into Imperm too many times to be like, well, okay, I'm just going to switch to Valor, right? I'm going to play one nib because it's not great in this format, but it's good enough to where I think it's worth playing at least one copy of. We're also playing Max C. You want to have that threat in your deck if your opponent's like trying to like just pop off and just kill you through Max C because you don't have any responses. You're like, okay, no, I got nib, right? So it's like, it's just that fail safe kind of card. You're not going to draw it too much unless you're drawing it off like Maxi or something. Also, having like a 7 mat noir and then drawing a few cards in your opponent's standby phase with Sleepy into a nib is very oppressive because it's very hard to play through a noir with multiple spins that is unaffected by cards, right? Then the final card in the deck is two Fenrir. You guys are going to see this. This is all in all of my decks, spoiler alert, because I think this card is absolutely insane. Um... I think as far as like non-engine cards go, it's like Maxi in its own tier, and then like the next tier below that is like Fenrir, and like maybe a few other cards, but Fenrir is absolutely insane, and I think this is like, in any deck that can like reasonably play this card, I think you should probably be playing it. Um, down here are just two little like alternative options, I'll talk about those in a second, but for the extra deck we are playing one Sylph and Princess Sprite, this is just for like, you know, further extension. We don't play, like, we play a pretty high monster count, so this is not, like, something you want to go for every single game. But in a pinch, when you need, like, an extra card, you can just, you know, make this with two, like, you know, pure leaves, and then try to rip another spell to keep playing. Um, it's I don't like gambling. That's one reason I was kind of, like, you know, turned off of this deck in the beginning. But the more I've, like, built this deck and the more I've practiced with it, the less I've realized, the more I've realized it's not really gambling unless you're playing a card like Princess Sprite. Because this card... Yeah, it can be gambly sometimes and, you know, luck-based, but it's it's a lot of math-based more so than, um, well, not more so than Princess Sprite, but just in general, the deck is like revolves around resolving this thing, right? You can resolve this thing and you're going to hit more times than not with that. With the Princess Sprite, you kind of have to build your deck in a certain way to be able to like fully maximize Princess Sprite. And the hand trap version of the deck is just not something that does that because we play you know, that's 11 monsters right here, plus 6 right here. That's 17 monsters in our deck. And that just means hit. Like Princess Sprite is going to hit just barely over 50% of the time. Right? Depending on, like, the game state. So, it's a good card. You should definitely play it. But it's not, like, as good as it is in a build that's kind of, kind of more specified to always resolve it. Um, or plays more board breakers as opposed to hand traps. Right? Then we have uh, Symboled Nightingale. This is like kind of turned into like the go-to turn one play, which I actually think is really cool. You make a, a noir and you make this, and then it makes it so your opponent can't kill you, um, because just yeah, it's like okay, I've got my noir up, I've got an infinite follow-up with my friend, and like you know all the other purely cards, and I have this where you just can't kill me. So it's really strong. It's also is a really good tool to make Zeus because it can attack directly. You all know this card is absolutely insane. And we're playing one Robin. This has kind of like fallen out of favor, I think, the past like week or so in this deck, but I still think it's quite good, and I, the deck has like enough spots in the extra deck where I think you can reasonably put this in, and where it can be really good. If you know what matchup you're playing against, this is probably not going to happen on ladder, but maybe if you're playing in a tournament or something, if you know the matchup, and you know that you can go for this and have like a little bit more of an oppressive turn one board as opposed to a defensive turn one board, it is very, very strong. And there's just certain game states where this card just like completely ends the game. Right, because this card just beats so many decks if you're able to summon with like two to three materials. Well, obviously two materials, but two or you know, two or more materials, right? If you're able to summon with like three materials, it's really, really good. Then we have downward Zeus just because this is kind of a downward Zeus deck. You know, when you're going second, you just make this and you just wipe the board or you just OTK them. Uh, then we have one happiness for OTKs, one big happiness for further OTKs. Um, really, I just want to put these two together because you can cut the big happiness and play another little happiness. It's really whatever you want. I just I like playing the big happiness because it's a cool card. You know, it's got an animation. It makes for really weird game states. I think it, like, it's pretty fun to play, so I'm kind of just like enjoying playing it. I also think it's pretty good. I think it's quite underrated. Um, its ability to... It, it makes the Mechanko... The, the, Makanko, however you say it, matchup incredibly easy to where you really don't have to do too much. You just kind of make this and just end the game, which is pretty nice. But And that deck is fairly popular on ladder, so there is like an actual reason to play this, but it's also just like a cool card and something I wanted to try out, so I've been trying it out a lot. Then we're playing two beauty, <clears throat> excuse me, so we're playing two beauty 
and then two plump this seems pretty self-explanatory right you really you play two of each little one and then you just don't play this one but um yeah, this ratio is fine if, if you want you could even like you know switch one beauty out but i probably wouldn't recommend that i think beauty is beauty at two comes up more often than happy at two does but to be honest like the only one that really comes up at two is like super frequently is plump um so yeah but the ratios here are pretty flexible right then of course like i've already said we have one happiness double noir and this card's absolutely insane uh, this this card it is this card is ridiculous. Uh, then I'm playing one IP Mascarena and one Azalea. The reason I'm going for this is because there's some board states where you. This is going to sound really weird, but going for IP can sometimes be just objectively better than going for something like Robin or Nightingale. And there's going to be like weird game states where. You can just play around so much by going for a card like IP, right? And IP into Azalea is just very strong. This makes this thing indestructible by battle, by battle, or uh, by card effects, excuse me. And it's just like a free pop on your opponent's turn. So it's quite cool. You could also, like, you could switch this out for an anima. You could switch this out for a few different things. Um, but I've really been enjoying the IP. It doesn't come up that often. Like, let's be real here. It doesn't come up like super often, but when it does, I think it is quite good. There are also certain lines where this can help you play around cards like DD Crow, um, and so on and so forth. But overall, there's just a lot of op there's a lot of free space in the extra deck, and that's also why Pot of Prosperity is so good in this deck because you know you just have free extra cards. So, anyways, that is it for the list here. Uh, I will move on really quickly to the Dark World variant, and we'll talk about the changes really quickly. They're not too many. I'll quickly go over the purely lineup. We got. It. Three white cat, three black cat, my friends, delicious, sleepy, happy, pretty, all at three, right? Max out on all this stuff. Then we're playing one street and one leap. I decided to go more, you know, I decided to play the dark world cards in a heavier, you know, capacity than play more of these. So cut two, cut two street, cut one leap. And we added the dark world cards in here, and we also cut some hand traps to add these in here as well. Uh, so we're playing three snow, one brow. One Pot of Prosperity, three Triple Tactics Talent in this list, one, three Max Z, three Ash Blossoms, one Nib, and two Fenrir. The reason I decided to go for this ratio is because, like, this, like, taking one Talons out and playing, like, one Valor, like, this just seemed kind of odd to me. Um, it didn't seem like this was, like, correct. It seemed like, at this point, I'm kind of, like, you know, committed to, like, it seemed like I was kind of committed to a more, like, not going second version, but a more, like, powerhouse going second version where i'm just going to try to like or going first version where like going second you can break boards a lot easier with this deck because you have so much more gas that's going on the fire with all the dark world cards but also going first you can put a like a much beefier board up than you can with like a normal you know standard purely deck so i'm less reliant on those draws and i care less about those draws like the sleepy draws in my opponent's you know standby face is quite nice but it's not as important in this match in this version as it is with the other version because we're just going to be putting up like, like I don't know, you're probably not going to be putting up double noir, but you could theoretically put up double noir, but you're really probably out, like, pretty often going to be putting up like noir, you know, assembled, Robin, Mascarena, like beauty, a combination of these different cards. You're probably going to end on three of them. You're probably going to end on a noir, maybe a beauty, and then one of the other three, right? As opposed to the other variants, which are going to pretty much just end on like a noir in maybe an exceed. Right, you're going to be ending on a little bit less in that version, but you're going to be relying more on those draws and hand traps. So I hope that makes sense. Um, I really like this version. This is honestly my favorite version that I've played of the deck so far. Um, but I have not... I want to pull this up really quickly. I have not tried the Graffa, Lucent, and Rainbow build. The reason I haven't tried this um, is honestly just because this stuff is like super expensive. These are URs and I don't have any of them. Um, so that's 90 UR CP that I just really don't want to spend on this guy. But I do think it is quite good. And in theory, it is quite good because you can go for cards like Nightmare Griffin, right? You can go for cards like Nightmare Griffin on like your turn and put up a Noir Griffin board, which is absolutely oppressive. And it's really, really difficult to break that. For the extra deck, the extra deck is pretty much the exact same thing here. Um, it's just, you know, the one pr one Princess Sprite, one Nightingale, one Robin, one Downer, one Zeus, one Happy, double uh, double Beauty, double Plump, one Happiness, double Noir, Azalea, and IP. 
same thing here. You can swap out the big happiness for the little happiness. You can swap out the IP for an anima, lingerie bow, or lingerie bow, whatever it is you want to play, right? Overall, <clears throat> I really like this version of the deck. If I had to choose one to play, I'm going to play the Dark World version because I think it has just, it's so much more explosive going first and going second. Something I am not a huge fan of with this deck is when it loses just so heavily to like one or two hand traps. You know, when I was when I'm playing the other version, more more often than um, way more often than I with this version, I should say, am I like going normal summon, you know, white or black cat, Valor, Imperm. Okay, activate my friend Ash. Turn pretty much over at that point, unless I have like a few more quick play spells and I hit off purely every time, right? The other version seems a lot more reliant to me on resolving purely, which is why I'm playing the, you know, the more purely cards. Um, I'm playing the three street, the two leap. This version seems so much more reliant on resolving this card and getting cards to your hand than the Dark World version because a lot of times you just burn through resources so fast and they don't really have ways of replacing themselves, especially if you're missing off of purely. Whereas this version, like, you can miss off this card and still be good because you're just maintaining advantage with this. Um, so it's really, really nice, and I've really enjoyed playing it so far. Moving on to the final deck of this video, it's going to be Naturia Runic. So um, for those of you who, you know, have you know, been following me or whatever it is for some time now, you probably know that I'm very high on this deck. I think this has been, since the tier hit, <clears throat> I think this is the best deck in the game. And I still, right now, think this is the best deck in the game. I think this deck is better than Purely. I think it's better than Dragon Link. I think it is probably, it, I think it is the best deck in the game. Now, we just got news the other day that, you know, Cash to your Rise Art is coming, and Full Power Cash is probably going to be here. And, you know, all this is me talking about this being the best deck is no longer going to exist because Cashier will be the best deck. But, right now, for Season 21, the Cherry Runic is still in a very, very good spot. But I did adapt the list a little bit over time to deal with purely a little more. So, I'm just going to show you, like, this list here on screen. I'll go over, you know, card by card really quickly, and then we'll talk about the changes that I made. Um, yeah, I, with what the deck looked like pre and post purely. So, starting off with the Naturia cards, we play 3 Cricket, of course, 3 Camellia, 1 Sunflower, 3 Blessing, 3 Sacred Tree. Obviously, this is just a full Naturia engine. Do not play more than one of this card. It absolutely sucks to draw. Um, so, yeah, just play one of this. You're good. Just, if you draw it, just discard it and summon it back. Or if you draw it, just normal summon it. Do something. I don't know. Uh, but don't play more than one of this. Uh, we're playing 2 Runic Fountains, 2 Tips, 2 Freezing Curses, 3 Flashing Fire, 2 Destruction, 2 Slumber, 2 Smiting Storm, 2 Dispelling, and 1 Golden Droplet for 16 Quick Play Runic Spells, plus the 2 Fountains, so 18 Runics total. It really sucks in this game that all these are freaking limited, basically, or semi-limited, I should say. Like, this is at 2, this is at 2, this is at 2, this is at 2. It's so whack, but whatever. We gotta adapt, and we gotta do what we gotta do. Like, these cards aren't that bad, right? But, um... You know, we got 16 runic spells here. Then we got room for 9 non-engine because of that. So we're playing 3 maxi, 2 Fenrir. Told you this card is in all my decks because I think it's fantastic. I'm now playing 2 kaijus post um, purely release and 2 triple tactics talents. For the extra deck, we're playing 2 Hugans, 2 Garys. Um, this is obviously the perfect ratio. Of this I don't know what the meta for this deck looks like on Master Duel, like Master Duel meta, but I would assume it's... 100% like 100% on two of each of these. This is just the perfect ratio. Um, I have in tournaments been playing a Munin. And the reason I've been playing Munin in tournaments is just for time rules because this deck does go to time quite a bit, and it's nice to have that free life gain um, that's way more reliable than something like Scarlight, uh, which is burn. This is life gain. This is just a lot more consistent because you could almost always get this out, whereas with Scarlight you can't always get it out. Then for the Synchros, we're playing one Beast, one Charge Warrior, one Coral Dragon, one Trishula, because this card's awesome, one Baron DeFloor, and one Chang Ying. For the Exceeds, we're playing one Exciton Knight, this card's insane, one Baguska, this card's insane, one Dugaras, this card's insane. Then for the Lynx, we are playing one Donner, and post purely release, I am playing one Underworld Goddess of the Closed World, which I have never summoned on ladder in this deck. But it's here because. 
in theory, this is the only guaranteed out that you have to a untargetable noir. Right, so let me talk about that really quickly. Um, a lot of people think that post purely release that this is not necessarily the best deck anymore because purely kind of just beats this deck when it goes first and it puts up a noir, it ends on like a noir, my friend, in the street and your noir has got like nine mats or whatever it is and it can't be, it's unaffected and they can just spin back your trees, they can spin back your fountain. How the heck does Noturia win? Well, this deck has really two lines of play to counteract that. The first one and the most consistent one, because it's the one that I've resolved the most, and also it just it works so well with your engine, is going for a Baguska play. So somehow get two rank four two level fours on the board, whether it be like double Camellia or Camellia plus Gary, whatever it might be, then overlay into Baguska. And this negates this makes it so like the noir can't do anything. It's still unaffected by card effects. But it can't activate its effect because it this is like just a continuous effect. So it's not an activated effect. Therefore, it's not Noir is not unaffected by it. The problem with this is if your opponent knows this, they're just going to make sure you never have two level fours on the board. They're just going to continue to spin them with Noir, which can be good for you because it's going to burn your no opponent's Noir spins, and then you're going to be able to resolve cards like Fountain. This is your primary counterplay. However, it doesn't always work that way, right? Sometimes you don't always have access to that. So that's why I added the goddess in here, just for like weird game states where I go, I have like a Hugin, a Hugin on board, you know, Mole Cricket summons two, then I'm blessing something, and I got like a bunch of bodies on board, but I can't really do anything with them for whatever reason, because maybe I messed up, or maybe they spun something. And you can just go, goddess, take the noir, and just deal with the problem that way. Like I said, this has never come up but it's in here for the weird situations that it might. Alternatively, you can just like cut this if you want, uh, because Baguska is pretty much your most consistent counterplay to Noir, and you could play, you know, throw the Scarlight in there, you could throw like a uh, Cyber Slash Harpy Lady in there. This card is actually really good in this deck because it triggers off of all your quick plays, so it's basically all your quick plays become like double interruptions, uh, which is quite cool. Uh, Naturia Barkeon is obviously a fantastic option because Labyrinth is semi-popular, but even like this card doesn't even like always win you the game versus Labyrinth because if they have Lady plus Big Welcome, they can just spin this, you know, bounce this back at the extra deck, and like at that point, you're just probably gonna lose because you're just like so far behind at that point. If they're getting to the point, if they're resolving Lady plus Big Welcome on you, like Big Welcome's effect from the graveyard, if they're resolving that, you're probably behind is what I mean, and you're probably losing that game. Um, so there's there's a few different options here, you know, um, but I'm probably going to stick with the goddess for a while just because like of the guarantee out that it gives me and the extra deck if I can somehow get it onto the board, right? Um, for like main deck direct outs, I decided to add two kaijus in post purely release because this deck does struggle going second against purely. Like that's not a secret. Like, this deck does really struggle going second against it. And if they make that untargetable, you know, unaffected noir, with like nine mats, if they are not going to let you Baguska or you can't get to it, then you need to draw into something that's going to give you an out to it. And Kaijus are one of the best outs in the game. They also dub over as really good outs to other opponent, like other deck stuff. Like if I'm playing the mirror match and my opponent ends on a Naturia Beast, I can just Kaiju it. You know, if you're playing against Math Mech and they, you know, go um, activate Super Factorial and go into their Exceed and then send a few cards, I can just Kaiju it. To you know, get around the negate. If I'm playing against Sword Soul, I can send the Baron. There's just a lot of stuff you can hit with Kaijus, and they're pretty good overall in the format. Uh, the format will shift when Cashier comes out, but of course we are not at that point yet. So right now I do think Kaijus are, you know, quite a fine option for Naturi Rune. Alternatively, like, well not alternatively, but prior to Purely's release, this is the list that I was playing. I was playing uh, Foolish Burial Goods and three talents as opposed to two. So I was playing one less non-engine and one more like engine card. And the reason Foolish Goods is the one that I choose over uh, another Golden Droplet down here to make it 17 on the Runic count is just because Foolish Goods can dub over as an Aeteria card and as a Runic card whenever you need it. Um, let's say you have you know two Runic spells in your graveyard, you have uh, or one Runic spell in your graveyard, and you have one in hand, and you don't really have a you don't need your Aeteria cards or whatever. You can just Foolish Goods send send another Runic and then activate your Runic and draw three. It just kind of cycles itself, right? 
but more often than not you're going to be sending the sacred tree to add one of your nature cards and just play from there so usually like nine times out of ten it's another nature card makes your nature engine more consistent but every once in a while it does dub over as a runic spell which is quite nice um sadly you just i felt like i had to cut this post purely because noir is a problem um, now, really quickly, I will say, going first, this deck absolutely annihilates purely because you just make Naturia Beast and you just laugh at them. <laughs> um, this card is absolutely oppressive. Um, it's absolutely insane. So, there's that. Uh, but yeah. Anyways, guys, that is, uh, that is it. Those are the three decks that I played this season on Ladder, uh, with my favorite... I'm gonna say my favorite being the Purely Dark World, just because this has been the most fun to play. Um, probably because it's like the new toy, right? Um, and it's super explosive. Like, it's just so explosive what this deck can do. It's absolutely awesome. Um, yeah, anyways, that's going to do it for me. Thank you guys so much for tuning in the video. Um, leave a comment down below what videos you'd like to see from me in the future. And let me know if you're liking Purely. And also if you're liking the format, because I'm personally loving the format right now. I think it's actually, the game is in a quite a good place. And I'm a little scared with Arise Hard and Castier coming out that that's going to change. But we'll talk about that when it happens. So, anyways, thank you guys so much again for tuning in this video. And I will see you in the next one. Have a great rest of your day. Peace.